I'm Cher Miller. I'm Rob Dietz. And I'm Jason Bradford. Welcome to Crazy Town, where to put up a new parking lot, the city just sold its watershed to the Nestle Corporation. Oh, you pay paradise. Put up a parking lot. (laughs) This is producer Melody Travers. In this season of Crazy Town, Jason, Asher, and Rob have been exploring the watershed moments in history that have led humanity into the cascading crises we face in the 21st century. Today's episode is the season finale, and it highlights some connections among this season's topics, considers some additional watershed moments that didn't make the final cut, and reviews some of the ideas out there that are leading us into a safer, saner, and more sustainable society. So the astute listener will realize that over the course of the season, Melody has been reporting the rise in population and the rise in CO2 equivalent in the atmosphere. It doesn't take the most scientific observer to realize uh, things are going up in a pretty big way. Give us some stats. Yeah, I will do that. In our first episode on the taming of water, the date was roughly 10,000 years ago, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and the CO2 concentration was 250 parts per million. Mm. Of oh, course, good old days. Aspirationally, you know, you do at 350.org, we want 350 parts per million. But Yeah, it makes those guys look yeah. like yeah. lame. Yeah, yeah. And, and where are we today? We're now in 2022 at 420 parts per million. Well, that's not even a doubling. I think population is more interesting. Well, this this is true. You want to you want to do some crazy population. So, population 10,000 years ago was freaking 5 million human beings. 5 million. That's <laughs> it. Today in metropolitan Atlanta, where I grew up, Six million people. So, nice. Yeah. So you're Big, saying we could have fit everybody in the entire world yeah. in Atlanta with some room with to room. spare? That's right. They could some have elbow just, room. Everyone yeah. could have a yard. Well, or yeah. with, with room to make a million more babies. Oh, cool. Yeah. 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 Excellent. And you just have modern Atlanta. And the rest in the entire world empty. is just empty Empty of humans. wilderness. Think about it. You could have gone swimming in the ocean without getting plastic bags in your face. Oh, yeah. Would have been incredible. Oh. And encountered animals would be like, what What the fuck is this so, thing? So what today, we've got about 7.9 billion. That's B billion. Yeah. Uh, rather than the 5 million from back then. It's, Success. Yeah, we, we have done it. This season of tracking CO2 and population, though, has really been about watershed moments in history, right? We've covered all kinds of topics yeah. around... What's led us into crazy town where we're, there's too many of us consuming too much and, and the planet really can't handle it anymore? So what I thought would be interesting for our listeners is to share a few of our personal watershed moments. Oh, my gosh. I have to connect. Sort of a, I have to like... I have to reveal. I have to be vulnerable or something. Uh, that's right. Oh my god. That's right. I, or just when you've been in water, on okay. water, okay, and drinking in a, in water. In a shed. Yeah, in a shed or Being, on water. Yeah, okay. So, or in a shed drinking on water. water in a shed. Yeah. Sometimes it takes me a while. I'm glad you guys beat that one to death because it took me a while to understand what the hell you were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, so, well, give us. You start us off, Rob. This okay. is your idea. Yeah, I will. Okay, I, I'm going to do this. It. Yeah. So it's actually prom season when oh, we're recording yeah. this. My daughter just went to the junior prom and oh. had a really nice time. And my watershed moment, I'm going to take you back to my junior prom. Oh, my gosh. Uh, When is this, like 89 or something like that? Yeah, like 1988, I think, something like that. God, Uh, golden era. Yeah, it was just a a beautiful time. Mm. Great hair. Copper buns. Yeah. This watershed, yeah, I I had the tuxedo and all that. Yeah. Drove uh, my date to prom with two other friends and their dates. And, uh, You're not telling us about when you lost your virginity, right? We, no. You know that that's not the kind of watershed moments we're here to talk about. <laughs> no, right, no. Okay. I didn't want Jason to start making some bass sound. Boom, chicka, damn, well. <laughs> yeah. So, no. This, uh, this is actually has to do with a distrust of cars and automobile transportation in general. Okay. That's, that's where we're leading. So, okay. So I go to this prom, and at some point after we had dinner, I stopped back at my house to change clothes out of the, like, whatever I was wearing or to get a change of clothes. And at that point, my mom 
I think she was really worried that I was coming home to steal some beers or get some alcohol or something. <laughs> she got really nervous and she was like, y- you need to be home by midnight. I was like, what? It's, it's prom night. Are you kidding me? We got in this big argument. Started. Yeah, I know. Jeez. Uh, so anyway, I, I got this curfew slapped on me and I was too wimpy to just say, screw you, I'm staying out. So at the end of prom, I had to drive home and I was so pissed off. Uh. That I uh, I got lost. What? So I'm, I already you got lost. At you got lost coming home. Yeah, it wasn't at our school. It was like okay. somewhere downtown or something like that. And it had been a crappy prom anyway. I didn't have much fun. And I'm driving home and I'm speeding to try to <laughs> get home by curfew. Yeah. Oh, no. And I'm driving down a two lane road that has a center lane for making left turns. And there's a car going slowly in front of me. So I jump into the center no. lane to zoom past it. You know, 16-year-old idiot driver. And uh, they had a faster car than I did, and they took off. No way. Because, you know, it's like late night. It's probably another teenager Yeah, or another idiot. Yeah. So they take off, and uh, around the next turn, I'm, I'm probably doing 70 miles an hour. In the middle lane? No. At this point, since they passed me, I get back right. into the normal lane. But when I came around a turn, they were stopped dead. Like, just stopped in the road. So I slammed on the brakes, and the road was wet. Oh, no. And the car swerved, and I crashed into the yard of uh, of somebody just off to the side of the road. You had a auto accident on one of your prom nights. Yes, that's fantastic. Now, now, uh, luckily, I was alone, right? I wasn't yeah. driving a date home or something. But and this this happened coincidentally very close to my high school where I crashed. So it a was, bunch of people saw you. <laughs> it was like, well, no, it was late at night. It was within a you know a half a mile though of my high school. And the car crashes in, and I'm like, oh, shit, can I get out of here before anyone notices? <laughs> but the, I had blown the tire up. I had bent the, oh, the wheel because I had just crashed over this curb. And so I can't go anywhere. So I open the car door, and I get out. And the first thing I see is this guy coming at me, and he's got a gun pointed at me. So now <laughs> I've just crashed a car with all that adrenaline. And this dude is pointing a gun at me. Is that the homeowner? Yeah. Oh, fantastic. yeah. So, so I raise my hands up and I say, "Hey, uh, just a kid. Just uh, I'm no threat." And uh, he goes, "Oh, okay." And he puts the gun down. And and the guy. It, long story short, he invited me into his house to wait while my parents uh, came. The cops showed up like immediately. I guess the noise from me crashing was so loud that he. I'm jumped guessing out of that bed. other car had left. Yeah, yeah, they were yeah. long gone. I think they were trying to make me wreck. Yeah. So anyway, yeah, it this this whole scene though, it it kind of I think brought me to this level of like just not really trusting cars, uh, not seeing it as a good way to get around because of the consequences it can happen. And we don't really have to go into the gun stuff and whether that was a, that was okay or not. Some guy pointing a gun at a teenager well, for crashing you, a car. You're lucky you were white. Yeah. 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 But it was a, uh, yeah, it was, it was this, this kind of moment where I think it led me down the path of bikes Interesting. Bikes are a good way to get around, and it's been like a lifelong love affair with bikes and a huh. lifelong distrust of cars, and I, I think that was a, a bit of a watershed moment for me. Excellent. How interesting. Yeah. So you think trauma, it brought you here. Yes. Yeah. That can happen. You have crazy moments in your life that just shake you up a bit. Sure. Well, I, mine's a little nicer than that in the <laughs> sense that I was, I was 21 years old, and I somehow figured out that that I could go to Costa Rica for an entire quarter in college. And it was full credit and everything. And uh, that was amazing. I was in this biological station that was just built at the edge of this forest up in the hills and um, totally transformed how I saw the world and how I understood it. Was that your first time out of the country? No, but first time in the tropics. So I... I was already, of course, interested in plants and biodiversity as a biology major, but it just took it to this other level. And, you know, I met a baby spider monkey. Mm. <laughs> hard and to get happily cuter. ever after. Yeah, hard to get cuter <laughs> than that. So Brought I brought it home with you. Yeah. <laughs> Classic tale, boy meets spider monkey. Yeah, exactly. It's just heartwarming. Yeah. Yeah. But so this this actually brought you more into sanity town than crazy town. Well, it the, the juxtaposition Well, of, when you went home is oh, when you got to crazy town. Well, it's the juxtaposition of living 
on the edge of the forest and kind of interacting with this small town. This like this little hamlet of people that they were farmers and they had some dairy and it was just very humble, you know, the Costa Ricans at the time in this place and Probably before real big tourism, right? The tourism hadn't gone nuts yet. Yeah. So, yeah. And just to see how life can be so nice with all, all this stuff. Like, I was happy as I've ever been eating simply <laughs> rice and beans and plantains and, and walking everywhere. Oh, my gosh. I just walked miles and miles. Unbelievable. Interesting to corroborate what you're saying. Costa Rica... Uh, And the most recent survey topped the Happy Planet Index, Mm -hmm. which is this awesome measure of how long do the people live and how satisfied are they divided by their ecological footprint. Yeah, Yeah. and there's a weird, I think if you look at the history of it, there's this like weird glitch that happens, like a a huge spike at a certain point, I think right around the time that you left (laughs) Costa Rica, just went way up. Satisfaction through the roof. Yeah, uh, they lost a spider monkey, but they, they recovered. It was worth it. It was worth it. Yeah. How about you, Asher? What's your watershed um, moment? I may have actually shared this before, so apologies. So when I was a kid, I, when I moved to the United States from Israel, I think I was experiencing feeling like I was definitely not part of my culture. I was sort of outside, being uh, sort of this kid from Israel with a funny accent, funny name. I remember we lived on this property where, in, in the climate, the environment was so different than what I grew up in in, in Israel. I mean, mm-hmm. we had an, an acre of woods behind our house. Is this up we in the living. Portland area? This is, no, this is Massachusetts. Massachusetts, okay. Yeah, so Sudbury, Massachusetts. And I would just go kind of exploring the woods or whatever. And one day I found an arrowhead. And it kind of blew my mind, you know. Like, I didn't, wasn't really aware of the real history of this place. Yeah, that is so cool. I've always wanted to find an arrowhead and never, uh, I I don't think I've ever been close to one. Yeah. And, and then that led me to try to like, I I was curious about Native American history. And I remember Black Hawk was my hero for a long time. I think it was the first story I read really. It was, you know, he was a, he was a chief, and actually, I'm not even sure he was a full chief, but he basically led resistance efforts. Mm-hmm. And I think that was probably my first exposure to understanding a little bit about the kind of the dark side of colonial history. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, know, where, where this country came from and how, how recent it all is and what yeah. it was like just 200 years ago here in Oregon, for example. Yeah. It yeah. was a whole different people. Yeah. And how, how exploitative it's been and yeah. how rapidity, rapidness with yeah. which that happened. Yeah, the rap yeah. yeah, incredible. Yeah, that is nuts. Well, thank you guys for, for sharing these water these watershed moments. I wanted to say brought to you by and, and get one of Jason's advertisers, but <laughs> uh but no, I, I do appreciate hearing that. I think it 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 actually gives some insight into a, you know, why you guys, uh, why we're able to perceive what these these watershed moments were that led us into crazy town. And since this is the, the last episode of the season, we wanted to do a little looking back on on the various watershed moments and see if we could find some connections between some of them. And some of those connections, I think, are obvious. Yeah, we pointed know? them out during the during the season right. too. We would say, "Oh, this reminds me of." Yeah, I mean, you know, one that you could say is obvious would be the connection between advertising and online shopping. Right. right? I mean, I don't think I need to make any points about that to to realize those two are connected. But some of them, I think, are surprising. And one of the ones that struck me a connection. This season was was between air conditioning and racism. <laughs> you know, that right. seemed like pretty separate thing. You know, one's a kind of a standalone technology, and one is this um, fucked up ideology. Right. But uh, it also connects to advertising. We talked about this in the air conditioning episode, where where the advertising for it was like, "Hey, uh, without air conditioning." You'd be like these equatorial people lazy who are people. yeah, obviously Thinking lazy. <laughs> and, right. Yeah. So if you want to be productive, maybe like somebody uh uh you know who's who's under scientific management, which <laughs> right. we also talked about, <laughs> right. then you need air conditioning. Yeah. I, I mean I hate to say it, but I think you could t- probably tie racism, make a connection to 
to racism with a lot of things we 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 talked about the highway episode we did right you know yeah. talking about where highways were actually put right as a tool of of segregation not only using eminent domain to just n- basically knock down take away the property of of african americans but actually using it as a right. literally a wall to separate yeah. new communities a thread to me you know a, a really strong connection that kind of runs through is it's just the idea of domination. And, right. and you see that going back to the very first episode around water taming, domination of of nature in that way, and the animal menageries that we talked about. Obviously, the colonization stuff that we did, which was a form of domination over, over people and a domination over land. But all the way up through scientific management, if you think right. about the role of kind of managers dominating laborers right. and using these tools of management. I've I've developed a bit of an inferiority complex from all this. I mean, we have a dog each of us has a dog as part of our family and we have almost no menagerie without that. There's no tigers at yeah. Jason's house, you know, a share. You you don't well, maybe there's a well, spider monkey. Well, there's a spider monkey. monkey. Yeah. yeah, the spider monkey is amazing. But yeah, yeah. it's like we're not we're not with it. We're not. There, there uh, were frogs that were hanging out in the studio for a little while. Yeah, uh, I just, yeah. Go outside. There's plenty of animals outside that are free. Uh, oh, we're so not dominating. That's what I'm yeah. saying. I got this inferiority <laughs> complex. Well, what, one of the things that I think about was how much of this you could look through the lens of the World Fair and that episode and and what it connects to to me is like a microcosm of all of this because you've got. The racism, of course, in the World's Fair is the colonization aspect of it. The zoo-like exhibits connect between racism and colonies. Misuse of resources, right? Just crazy building out of things in these cities all the time. All the techno-worshipping, the myth of progress, skyscrapers themselves, you know, were modeled with these giant towers, like the Eiffel Tower. Roads, you know, the, all the road exhibits that were, what was that called? The uh, Tomorrowland Futurama, stuff, Futurama. Yeah, yeah. Of course, and commercialization of, of technologies and consumerism being promoted, like Cherry Coke. <laughs> so these are all these are all tied together in, in World's are, Fair. Are we sure we were getting this uh, critique that we've had correct? Uh, maybe we should have gone to some of these World Fairs. Yeah, it would be fun. <laughs> well, it was really interesting to see how these episodes and the topics all tied together. Another thing that sort of wove its way through multiple episodes was that there were overarching causes of, of the problems that we have. We could talk about, say, water taming as a watershed moment, you know, building the first dam or the first canal system. But it it's really based on some ideology. So, for example, faith in technology uh, is something that that is woven as a, an overarching problem that has kind of caused our descent into crazy town. There's also a recurrence of human supremacist thinking. I think that's how we get to the domination stuff that you were talking about, mm-hmm. Asher. Mm-hmm. And my favorite, quote unquote, recurring problem that we saw through a, a number of topics was the idea of how disconnected we've become from nature. And on that subject, if you've read Sherry Mitchell's book, Sacred Instructions, we interviewed, well, I share, you interviewed Sherry as part of this season. And that's a great book. She got a foreword in there from Larry Dossey. And he has this quote that I think sums up exactly the the problem of that disconnection from nature that we've been talking about. He says in there, A common denominator underlies these various problems. As a society, we have attempted in one way or another to secede from nature. We have come to believe that the ancient natural patterns that have developed across eons do not apply to us. We have severed our ties with one another as well. I want to follow up on that last statement, severed our ties with one another, because I sort of see that as also a repeated theme. And it's it's an interesting situation we have where we often have these like villains in our in our episodes where you're like look at what this this person did yeah, it's a right. watershed moment of just someone's nutty idea or whatever and so but a common thread i sort of see this stemming from is the surplus of civilization allowing 
control and expansion to occur of these societies, right? Mm -hmm. But usually there's like a, a some sort of dominant class of people, kings, right, priests, some sort of wealthy business person, and, and they really go on power trips, right? Yeah. And they believe they're better than others or they have the way. And some say this this all began with like the agricultural revolution, right? Where humans now start controlling water and they start controlling the breeding of plants and animals and and that allows for the surplus and it allows for this this class of people that are separate themselves from others. I mean, maybe that's true, but gosh, fossil fuels really turbocharge these dynamics. And it went from sort of regional shit shows where civilizations would rise and falls to now sort of this global clusterfuck we have. Yeah. Regional shit show to global cluster. Yeah. Work, huh? They talk about progress. Yeah. Evolution yeah. right yeah. there. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think that there are a lot of causes, sort of foundational drivers of, of these issues, these watershed moments we've discussed. Sometimes I think I try to think about them a little bit like a, like a pyramid or like building blocks of like fucktitude. Okay. You know, like, uh, by the way, that's trademark. No one can use it other than me. Okay. Uh, 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 it's like a, that's a shares perennial attitude is fucktitude. <laughs> no, just thinking about like the the things that built upon each other to serve as like the conditions under which we, all this stuff materialized. Like these all have to be kind of in place to get to where we've got. Sort of, and, and you could layer them in a sense. Okay. Now, okay. I haven't done this like a real in-depth thought exercise. It's not scientific yet. It's, it's not scientific. Are you no. sure it's a pyramid and not a Jenga tower? <laughs> it might actually be better to think of it as Jenga tower, okay. considering the, the house of cards that we're dealing with here. But Wow, another um, metaphor. So... First, I want to just thinking about it. It's like think about the natural capital that exists. I oh, I actually that hate that term. Mm -hmm. Okay, I know you do too, Jason. Mm -hmm. But from the standpoint of thinking about everything that had to go in over four and a half billion years of of geological history on this planet, including yeah. the creation of hydrocarbons that are right. left in the crust of the earth for us to go and harvest. Right. Yeah. Without that, a lot of this stuff wouldn't wouldn't be right yes so you have that as like a maybe a foundational building block and then you've got the evolutionary biology of humanity and we've talked about hidden drivers in our past episode which is like characteristics and traits and and things that have become part of the human condition that have yeah. been developed over time yeah that are there like like cognitive bias yeah, all these or... cognitive biases that we have the right? fact that we're this like social species and stuff like that is important yeah we discount too. the future you know we we, we seek Tribalism. novelty all all these things yeah. right so that's that's another building block that you can layer on top of that and then you have the holocene that we've been in right oh. a period of relative stability climatically you know that allowed agriculture to 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 flourish right. society i just exist, think of it as you know, Tomorrow is going to be like today, which was like yesterday. And it's well, it gives all us stability. Nice. Yeah, it yeah. gives us stability for now settlements so that you don't have right. to move populations. If you learn how to live in a place, you can rely on it to be somewhat the right. same next year. Right. So then you layer on top of that the, what we just talked about, which is humans controlling nature, right? Yep. And that transition, even in our mindset, from thinking about kind of having an animistic relationship with the natural world and the spiritual belief system, now it's more about like trying to control nature. Yeah. And then from that, you go to controlling other people. Why right? not? Yeah, why not? We're and, all X-Men, like uh, controlling the weather and then controlling and, everyone and around And maybe us. that started, I, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not a, a true historian of this, maybe that started with controlling, you know, of women. You, you think about how long, like, the diary system has existed. And, and then you get the formation of market systems and the mechanisms that reinforce the selfish gene, right? So you have basically, in effect, I would, I, I would back this up. You have the, the Protestant Reformation, in a sense, which led us to like think about the individual, mm, you know, and right, the right, right. individual's relationship with things. And then you create these markets that really build off of like, I get to choose for myself, what I want, and the market acts rationally because everyone's being selfish, you know. You layer on top of that scientific and technological progress, and then you supercharge it with fossil fuels, and boom. Bada bang, Recipe bada boom. for fucktitude. There you go. <laughs> wow. Yeah, you didn't even have to bake it for two hours. It's just You just combine no, the No, you just light on fire, man. There's the gas right there. <laughs> well, you know, I think 
it's pretty cool that we could see these overarching problems that you know that, that, that basically spurred these watershed moments, which then, of course, led through the history that we've covered. But one of the other areas that also you could see some recurring themes was in the do the opposite sections, mm-hmm. you know, sort of the, the, I don't, it's hard to call them solutions to those problems because there's no, as we've seen this whole season, there's no simple solution to any of this, but there were some things that we covered, I think again and again, because it applied to you know, yeah. more than just the topic at hand. So to me, the most important one is we often talked about, you got to think differently. You got to think critically. You got to think in systems and it's about changing your worldview and changing your thinking, changing your conversations as a result, and, and changing what you do from day to day, and, and maybe even changing your underwear. <laughs> Every once in a while. <laughs> Semper ubi sub ubi. <laughs> oh, wow. Pulling favorite, out the Latin. Favorite that Latin is, phrase of sweet. all time. Well, I think I, it's the only Latin phrase. <laughs> or one of the e only E pluribus ones. unum. Yeah. Okay, come on. Those two are like side by side yeah. in terms of... Yeah. Their their cultural significance. I go I go to like uh, Roman ruins and I, so, I I gaze at them as if I know what I'm I'm looking at. I'm like, oh yeah, oh yeah, semper ubi sub ubi. So if you yeah. took e pluribus unum, I wonder if that would go in our overarching problems or our overarching solutions. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <right>. part. <laughs> uh, well, I'm going to follow up on what you said. It's interesting is that we often talked about culture materialism, where ideas often emerge, but the ones that work are the ones that are supported by the material conditions. And what you're kind of saying is that in some respects, you're asking us to put these ideas, like what, what we would call the superstructure, ahead of the changes in infrastructure, which is almost a little bit backwards from what, what we see happening a lot. But I think what we're trying to do is get ahead of the curve. Yeah, right? <laughs> I, I think you're right. I think it, it is a little backwards compared to that theory of cultural materialism. But we clearly have the power to yeah. do it. I mean, that's why you get... We talked about Lewis Mumford and his ability to foresee Foresee, how stupid the highway build out was going to be for this nation. Well, maybe that's when we actually become wise is when we when we can flip the script on that. I think that's exactly right. Our belief systems being born from material realities, and then we create just. We talked about that with with invention of racism, right? It was a construct to justify exploitation. Yeah. Yeah, so if we can get to that point of, of kind of doing the opposite. Right. And, and so I, I would say like one of the key things we talk about then in this regard is related to energy literacy, right? Now, right now we're, we're optimizing for, for financial returns. You know, we're chasing dollars, which are these digital representations. We? All... I, I'm not. <laughs> I know. Oh, I have, I've been an ultimate money. failure. Man, I am <laughs> sitting on a pile of cash so big, it's bigger than your pyramid of the overarching problems this year. <laughs> I'm sitting on a bunch of uh, Bitcoin hard drives, you know? <laughs> I've been spending the past 20 years or so doing the opposite in a sense, like from this lens, this ecological lens, this energy literate lens, trying to think about optimizing for return on energy, for being frugal with materials rather than dollar, dollar, dollar. That, that's why you're so happy gas is going up. You're just finally having a financial return. <laughs> and for and you. the way you know you're successful is the more money you lose. <laughs> The better job you're doing. Right. right. It's like, I'm willing to go perform my own human labor instead and be exhausted right. at the end of the day and get a little bit done. Yeah. But, but anyway, I, I think, though, this is about being prepared for what's coming rather than just sort of the ideas that have bubbled up and worked in the past, thinking that they will be functional going forward. Or, or uh, again, this is why we call it do the opposite. We've gotten into the situation because of these ideas and the actions that they represent and, and reinforce. And so anyway, that's my kind of take on it. Yeah, you know, I think an interesting thing that could come out of that is a rebalancing between how many of us have bullshit jobs, which we've talked <laughs> about, and how many of us are sitting here podcasting and typing away <laughs> at computers versus actually doing physical work in the real world, in nature, yeah. and and maybe that could even help reaffirm some of this reconnection to nature that we so desperately need. I totally think so. The other day I was out there on the farm and I was so happy because there was this bird species that I had never seen here at my home and property. I'd seen it out in other places, but I was so excited because it's this beautiful bird, the lazul bunting. And I'm like, oh, 
there it is. It's here. It's the first time I've seen it here, but I was aware enough. I've been around enough and spent enough time outside. And that was just one of those, like, made my day yeah. moments. Right? This, now, this is blown here by the, the winds coming, no, the fire no. winds coming from No, it's known in this area. just not okay. that common. And now we got to figure out a way to monetize that. <laughs> exactly. so it, it's pretty, all right. It's a pretty bird. It's feathers. I could I could make a giant cape out of them or something. Yeah, yeah well, that, then we're going to go back to the uh, old uh, Victorian hat days, right? Yeah. A lousy little bunting hat. Oh, yeah, that sounds great. Yeah. Sometimes I actually feel bad. It's a confession time. Sometimes I feel like we are repeating ourselves when we do the do the opposite stuff because it does feel like there are these certain notes that we keep hitting. And they're frankly, I think because one, it's hard to sort of say, do this specific thing or do that specific thing. It sort of depends on people's circumstances, right? What they're what they're able to do, what they're motivated to do. And they might have better ideas than we have Absolutely. anyway. I, I would put my money on it. But um, we don't have any money. That's <laughs> yeah, true. We just established God. that. Monopoly not, money. Okay, my monopoly money. So I kind of feel bad about it. But I think at the end of the day, these are kind of foundational also in terms of, of, of doing the opposite. And and it's a little bit connected to what you're just talking about, Jason. And that is just thinking about the personal action that we as individuals can take and the way that we develop new skills for, if we're talking about getting ahead of the collapse or trying to stay with or staying ahead of the consequences of everything that we've been talking about, mm-hmm. thinking about what skills, what new skills we might need to develop. If you have children, also think about the kinds of skills that they might need to develop. A lot of them, I think, are probably practical skills, but they're also the skills of being able to relate with people. Yeah. And I think that that's a really key one that we've talked about, which is getting to know your neighbors, building community. There's no way that any of us are going to be able to get through on our own. We're actually not conditioned. We've talked about this. We're not conditioned as a, as a species to operate in isolation in any case that is not fulfilling to us, right? Yeah. So building that skill set, I think, is a really key one. And I, I want to just say any action, no matter how small, can be a real positive for the community, for your own mental health. One of the things I've told you guys about how Portland has a really terrible litter problem now. And one of the things I've done, I just got a wagon and a trash can and I walk around picking up litter. And it's been amazing to me how many people have connected with me yeah. in a pretty deep way. Like there's a business nearby that sells seafood and the guy that runs it is so appreciative. He gives me seafood every once in oh, a while cool. when I'm walking by picking up trash. Fish it, heads? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I would. No, <laughs> are, no really good some stuff. Some of the, the meth dealers, are they uh, also showing their appreciation yeah, they, and giving you some? they uh, give me free needles when I want them. <laughs> yeah. Here's no, some fentanyl. But I mean... It, it's just been a, a fairly amazing realization of that even something as you know, simple as walking around and picking up some trash is a community builder. Yeah, and, and maybe it's not actually something we talked to, we we talked directly about before, but there's something about testing your own edges, trying to do something that might be a little bit uncomfortable. You think cleaning the outhouse down by the baseball field is outside my comfort zone? It could be. <laughs> um, well, you are right, sir. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, my case, uh, and this is not me like uh, tooting my own horn here, but you may know this about me already, but you wouldn't be surprised if you didn't. I'm not a big rally guy, you know? I'm not a rah, 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 like go down to the protest. I thought you were the head cheerleader in college. I was, and I stopped. I had some traumatic experiences when they were throwing me up in the air. Um, uh, but I... Spider monkeys are good for that. I decided after, you know, I was, like so many people, so distraught and upset about the, the recent school shooting that happened in Texas. I just decided I'm going to post something on social media and invite people to come down to the courthouse and just to feel like I wasn't just going to sit cynically and think, oh, fuck, the Congress is never going to do anything. And it's not going to change the situation necessarily, uh, having done that. But it was a way of stepping forward into community, inviting other people. Yeah, exactly. Again, a community builder, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, I think that's uh, that's exactly what we're talking about, taking those steps to to work with your neighbors, to become an asset to your community, to yeah, just be a kind, functioning person. We could talk more about some of these common threads of, of do the opposites, but 
I want to leave us some time to consider wh- where we screwed up, okay? I want to talk oh, about... We don't, yeah, what do you yeah, mean? We don't have yeah, much time, dude. The whole thing, <laughs> right? I was expecting you to say, uh, That was not to give us open season to... It was uh, 1978. <laughs> and, uh, no, no where, we, where we screwed up in missing some of the watershed moments in history that we could have picked for this season. Ah, uh, yes, yes. But yes. left off the list. Well, so in our defense... I think there are a bunch that we came up with, and we had amazing help from. So, so you're saying originally we had a perfectly uh, no, I'm not saying we're perfect, but there there are ones that I I definitely had thought about, and I yeah. was sort of like, uh, wish we could do this, and and we knew we didn't have the capacity to to do them all. One that I really wish we could have touched on, and I actually just referenced it a little bit was the Protestant Reformation. And the direct, in my view, the direct line from that to the Declaration of Independence. And by that, I mean changing the, what was so profound about the Protestant Reformation that was about having a direct relationship with God, right? Mm-hmm. Not needing to go through the, the Catholic Church right. through a priest to have that relationship with God. You can have a direct relationship. And in my mind, that leads, it leads directly to, you think about the Declaration of Independence, right? It's about the individual pursuit of happiness and well-being and, and codifying that within our culture. And, and the United States is obviously like an extreme example of this, but the individual yeah, is being it, the center of everything. We went from know. we cultures to me cultures. And there's yeah. a mixed bag about that, right? Part of me is like, yeah, for gosh sakes, you know how corrupt the institutions oh, course, were? Yeah. And then part of you going, oh, but what happened next? And it's so That's tipped it. in that direction right. now, right? Right. Yeah. Well, and I think... Uh, from that we to me is sort of related is the idea of the formation of the corporation. We thought about that too, like Mm -hmm. picking the, the founding of the Dutch East India company in, in 1602 as a watershed moment and decided to leave that off the list. And I, I kind of remember why it was, uh, at least for me, it was because I thought the documentary, the corporation had already covered this so well that, you know, what 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 were we we going to add? Right. Uh, Exactly. One that we could have put in there still, I think, but it's a little complex because it's it's not a clear date about this. It's the making of steel and how important that was that to learn how to make steel. Because it's been done for thousands of years on small scales, but of course, you know, not as reliably done, the quality varies. But then there was this thing called the Bessemer process in the mid-19th century, which essentially got it consistent and in the mass production. And yeah. so that that's a key moment, obviously. Look at the world we yeah, have now. Yeah, the build out of modern infrastructure. Yeah. Another one that's important, but is well known. See, part of what we wanted to cover were things were not as well known, mm-hmm. but germ theory. <laughs> so it's incredible to think about that. So for so long, people had no idea why, why disease occurred. And if you don't know why it's occurring, then you can't do anything about well, it. Well, go back to our positive thinking episode. It's because <laughs> right. you're, so you're thinking badly is why you get it. Yeah, or yeah. They're, they're bad humors, something right. in the air. Come on. Well, exactly. If, if bad yeah. humor causes disease, we, we invite everyone to stop listening yeah. to this podcast. Bad humor. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true. That the, the timing about, remember we talked about this, that during this positive thinking era, it was right before Louis Pasteur became really popular, well-known. And yet, even though that work was in the realm, you know, in, in, the, in the society at the time, eh, it kind of brushed it aside and positive thinking took off in other ways. Yeah. But anyway, antibiotics derive from the idea that, oh, there are actually little organisms and let's find a way to control them. Yeah. So that, that, was in the, that was in the mid-1850s, right. even though there was the ideas of germ theory going way back hundreds of years, but the church didn't like it. So. Well, and you talk about mixed bag results. I mean, right. I'm pretty thankful that we have antibiotics and some of these technologies, but I, you know, that's a big contributor to the ballooning of population. Yeah. And, but you, know, you hate to think of how it would have gone without germ theory and without that. Oh, yeah, I'd probably be dead by now. Yeah. Another one that we could have covered, which is maybe the most important modern watershed moment, is the development of the Haber-Bosch process for synthesizing fertilizer. Well, and also ammunition. It really helped help with explosives. Right. <laughs> yeah. So the combination of the two from this one process. But the idea of how to fix nitrogen synthetically, you wouldn't have 
the population we have. You wouldn't have the farming that we have. Hey, it's There's just no almost right. impossible to overstate. How profound. And we're talking about how profound it is. We left it off the list because there's an awesome Radio Lab episode. Yeah, it's so well and we're, yeah. we're not Radio Lab here. <laughs> right, right. And then the other one that's really well known that's, of course, incredible watership could be, could be, could be one of the most important ones. It could, it could be the most important one, yes. if, depending upon uh, what happens. <laughs> what so happens. I'm guessing you're talking about the Manhattan Project. The Manhattan Project yeah. in the 1940s. And why do they call it the Manhattan Project? What did it have to do with Manhattan? Because they were drinking every night. Oh, I see. <laughs> right. Manhattan's. Okay. Yeah. It was the beverage. That was a but... rule. Ten Manhattans per person <laughs> per night. That's the only way you could create yeah. a nuclear bomb. And live but, with yourself. Yeah. yeah. But just, I mean... Fission and fusion got understood and manipulated, and we have we haven't figured out fusion power, but fission obviously. Oh, it's a right around the corner, dude. Right around the corner. Always thirty years away. <laughs> but yeah, uh, transformative, obviously, and that was, of course, the, the nightmares as I was a child was the the use of those weapons. Yeah, another one I think that would have been a pretty fun story to tell, fun in a weird way, is the invention of the shipping container, which we may have talked a little bit about. I remember we've done some episodes about yeah. global trade. Yeah, um, I think so. And that that one isn't as well known as how important it is. So that could yeah. have made the list for sure. That was back in the in the mid nineteen fifties. Interesting story of and, and there's been some great writing about that and and how profound. Again, you, almost impossible to to overstate how profoundly transformative that just that design shift and what that led to yeah. has had. It, it lowered the cost of transporting goods by such a huge factor. Yeah, that that's how you get globalization. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, I, another one for me that. I think we could have hit and didn't was the fall of the Berlin Wall, which, of course, people know about and is hugely important from a world politics scene. But I think it has a lot to do with the burgeoning of capitalism and the spread of consumerism to basically all the world. Again, another piece with the shipping containers that gets us to this globalized, right. crazy trade economy. I think what's what's meaningful about that is is almost that there isn't an alternative, right? Right. It's not just the fall of the Berlin Wall, but the the, the fall of the Soviet Union. Yeah. Obviously, you still have China and these other governments that practice quasi-communism, if you want to call it that. But but yeah, it, it, it was sort of like... A, Everyone's in, in, on board now. Yeah, yeah, this is it. This has been proven to be yeah, the, the way to go. Yeah, neoliberalism. There exactly. we go. Yeah. Another one that we didn't get into too much and... There's so much around modern computing technology, the internet, social media. When we touch on different pieces of it, it's kind of hard to pick like a single watershed moment that led us here. But I do think that as a whole, if you look at that, the transformation that's that's arisen through the combination of technologies that have led to not only the personal computer, the internet and broadband communications, but... Maybe to pick one thing, you, you maybe you look at like Moore's Law, for example, when there's sort of the discovery that they could double the speed of microchips every 18 months or so. Yeah. And that, that has continued. So the exponential function there has underwritten, basically undergirded the vast explosion of us computerizing with, everything. With an asterisk, because now supply chain issues are going to probably slow that down. Yeah, maybe. And I think that's interesting to consider. Like, are we in another watershed moment? You're talking right now. Right now, right? Because you said the pandemic, the supply chain breakdown, Russia then invading Ukraine, the rising energy costs. Are we in one of those turning points where we're going to look back on it and it, say this was kind of the breakdown of the neoliberal order? I, I don't know. Yeah, but I mean, I, I hate the notion of trying to accurately predict the future, but... The fact that energy prices have risen so high, and of course that underpins the whole entirety of the economy, I would guess that, yeah, we're we're in at least, if it's not a watershed moment, it's at least a tributary to that well, watershed. Yeah. It will be interesting to look back because just like with the, with the watershed moments that we've explored before, it's really rare that you have a, a singular episode, singular moment that completely changes the course of everything. Yeah. I mean, that, that does happen sometimes. You could look at at September 11th, for example. Yeah. But these things are not born in a vacuum. They happen coming out of a context. They occur in a context of some kind. And so just like when we talk about systems thinking, think about the interrelationships between things, it's 
it's important to recognize that it's this this confluence of all these different forces. But historically, we do tend to look back and try to tell a simple story. And, and it will be interesting to see what is that story that people use to describe the ongoing moment, let's say, that we're in right now. Will it be the pandemic? The moment it would be, it'll be known as the, um, who's a basketball player? Uh, <laughs> Will Chamberlain? No, 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 no. The guy. Manute Bull? No, you're going too <laughs> you're just, far back. You're just uh, naming random people. <laughs> yeah, now. Larry Bird? The 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 French dude that plays for Utah Jazz. Um, oh, Rudy Gobert. Rudy Gobert, thank you. Okay. Yeah. Rudy Gobert, that could be March 11th, 2020. You know, what did he do? When well, Rudy, he, Rudy Gobert... He was making fun of COVID, yeah. and, it's, uh, and then he, he uh, sort of coughed on his microphone. <laughs> and intentionally and rubbed all the microphones of all the, the, the reporters. And then like oh. a day later, it turns out he has COVID. And that, on, on that cloud. right? Where would yeah, that happen? That yeah. shut down all sports. Yeah, yeah, I remember this. And that like triggered all these other things. So it could be that we look back and yeah. we're like... He's yeah. the most important man in in, <laughs> in the history of the of the early part of the twenty first century. Yeah. yeah. To be honest, some of our watershed moments we picked because they were entertaining, not necessarily because it was the very start of some right. monumental change. But I think Rudy, old Rudy, there might fit into that as a <laughs> that kind of entertaining a good example. Story. Yeah. Um, I think we've gone through a, a pretty solid list there of, of things that we either intentionally or unintentionally left off the season. Obviously, we couldn't cover every important moment in history. In history. But I want to turn us to, instead of the watershed moments that led us into this mess that we're in now, can we just review a few what we might think of as sanity town watershed moments, things that have led us in a positive direction, almost the do the opposite direction. Okay. Uh, And I I can kick this off with the classic of the paradigm shift. And that's the turn from Ptolemy's view of how the universe works to Copernicus's view. So Ptolemy, if you recall, thought that the earth was the center of the universe and all heavenly bodies rotate around it. And, you know, that kind of fits with our human supremacist thinking and, and some of the other problems that humanity has. And along come the the later astronomers, the Galileos, and then Copernicus says, no, 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 the sun is the center and the earth and the other planets revolve around that. And it's a total shift in thinking. Of course, it was fought by the church and, and uh, everybody who already, quote unquote, knew that the world must have us at the uh- center. I think we just need to put a little caveat here because we talk about cycles. Yeah. And it could well be that this was a short-lived thing and we'll return to a worldview that puts the earth back in the center. I mean, you mean we got the, the flat earth. Yeah, we yeah. got the flat, the flat earth at the center of the universe. Right? <laughs> it's just a bunch of squares floating in a plane. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Uh, sorry, I shouldn't mock. You, it was obviously a, a, a deeply profound. You can't time. help yourself no. from mocking, and neither can we. On along the lines of heavenly bodies, think about the the first photo taken from space of the Earth that people saw, and the three of us weren't around when that happened. When that became, I think, a, a pretty profound experience for for people. Yeah. But I but I think that it really was. You know, for people to be able to see this little. Sp- spinning ball of blue in space, you know, and realize that Yeah, that was our parents' generation. They were yeah. They were they were young adults at the time. It's so. like a, a context resetter. You yeah. Know, and like it's, you're on this limited thing that's that's really alone. It's wow. it's interesting. I saw this sort of documentary that was done with astronauts talking about almost the religious experience that they had when they went out into into orbit and to see the earth and how profound of a shift that experience was for them, even though they had spent their, their well, career William Shatner just right. had one of those moments recently. Yeah, I was just gonna say, I mean, this is why Jeff Bezos is so well grounded now because, you know, he just <laughs> barely went out. You know. No, but I, th- I think that it does have, it's a pretty profound shift. We don't know what it's like to not right. see the, the earth in that way. Yeah, you know? and then we had all these, all these like voyagers and stuff that would go out to Jupiter and then look back and you're like, Oh my of god. Of course now to try and take a photo from space. All you can't really see the earth because they're all the fucking satellites and space. There's a, there's a Tesla floating in the <laughs> exactly. way. <laughs> it's all in the way. You know, the guy who actually made that 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 photo famous, you know, and that concept out there 
you, Stuart Brand is now uh, an eco modernist. Oh, he's a rabid eco modernist. Oh my ball. gosh. Um, uh, sadly, well, yeah. he can he can go live on the Death Star then. <laughs> if I think about the history of these different societies, one of the things that comes to my mind is how awful it would have been potentially if you were like you mentioned, you know the. The, the Copernicus, if you're a Copernicus or a Galileo or anyone with any kind of heterodox views, what, what can you do? There was the, the church and the state were one for a long time. So I think this notion that, no, that's not the way it should be, the separation of church and state that was made popular in America, maybe that's one of those ideas that, that we can be proud of, I think. I for think. as long as it lasts. For as long as it Again. lasts. I know. I mean, Handmaid's yeah. Tale, who knows? <laughs> Right. It was fun while it lasted. It was fun while it lasted. Well, I think on that note, thinking of things to be proud of, uh, I've always had the softest place in my heart for the whole abolition movement and the civil rights era and the the things that people did to oppose yeah. you know, one of the, the, the kind of invention of racism and the, the crap that, that we discussed in that episode. And the 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 thing that I think I am most wanting to point out is you have these what you could call watershed moments in civil rights, like you know, you know the story of Rosa Parks refusing to give up her seat on the on the public bus, and those are those are amazing stories. But behind them is always thousands, millions of small acts of defiance and of people taking courageous action that built a huge movement that made that watershed moment possible. And that's something I often tell young people or anybody <laughs> that's willing to listen to me is like, if you want to start a landslide, you know, you you throw your pebble on the side of that mountain and it may not be the one that generates the eventual landslide that changes everything. But without all of those pebbles being thrown, it's not going to happen. So any place you see a chance to get in and do your part, get in there. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that we, I'll speak for myself, I think I struggle sometimes with being a little too cynical about things and not recognizing that while none of these, none of the forms of progress we've had are perfect, there has been meaningful progress on a lot of fronts. Think yeah. you're, you're talking about movements, right? You yeah. think about the labor movement. Women you know. can vote now and own property and yeah. hold office. I mean, my gosh. Yeah, the, the you know the power of people to to come together to fight for for justice and for for them to actually it's not perfect, obviously, and there are waxing and waning moments over history as as power struggles exist, and I would say we're. We're in, in, in a struggle right now on, on that front. But yeah, the power of people to mobilize. I yeah. think there's a lot of, of cases that we can look to. And there's also, though, I mean, I may bring up another some other like just individuals that had amazing ideas. And I, I considered like Charles Darwin to be one of those, just, you know, like the Galileo's and the Copernicus and stuff. Just he, well, other people were coming up with a similar idea at the time, you know, Wallace and stuff. But, but again, Completely different worldview <laughs> evolution, right. mm-hmm. and um, but what's interesting about it also is that there was a woman in the 20th century that really was additive, I think, to Darwin, and that was Lynn Margulis, mm-hmm. Carl Sagan's wife, at one point. Yeah, they, they had to be like the highest IQ couple <laughs> around. Yeah, right? not not just like scientists, but also uh, unbelievable communicators. Oh, amazing! And she basically pointed out that life isn't about just divergence and competition, but there's an incredible amount of symbiosis that happens, that there's there's cooperation. So she sort of balanced the view that it may have been, Darwin may have been taken to an extreme a little bit because of social commentators, but the notion that things come together. So even the cells in our body, the, the, we, are, we are a combination of enveloping a bacteria, the mitochondria. Plants also have chloroplasts. And then there are more non-human cells in the human body than there are human cells, right? And then there's thousands of species of bacteria. That, what about you know, the lizard people? Do they have more <laughs> non-human, non-lizard yeah. cells than lizard? Oh my God, that, that's an amazing story. 
So life is some of the greatest moments in the history of life are really about the the coming together of different forms and that cooperation and yeah. and symbiosis is such an important part and the mutualisms of of ecology and how the world really works. I, I think that maybe we're in. I mean, we talked about maybe we're actually in a in a watershed moment right now, of kind of pandemic on. We could be in a similar sanity town moment right now with, a, with a, I think, a growing recognition of that symbiosis. If you think about, and obviously this is probably in certain circles, right? But a recognition of gut biome, for example. Yeah, you know exactly. I mean? yeah, yeah. And people be thinking now about regenerative agriculture and, and the, the soil, systems yeah. and thinking about mycelium and, and yeah. how nature is so much more complex and other creatures do complex thinking, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, right. Doing math or whatever. I think we might be in a in a renaissance moment, which is in a, in, in a sense, if you combine that with, it's not a rise necessarily of indigenous thinking, but I do think that there is a growing, and again, in certain circles, a growing recognition of the wisdom of, of ancient practices in ancient ways of thinking and of being yeah. that had been able to persist, which were ones that were developed, not because this group of people is more special than this group of people, but the continuity of knowledge that has come down from thousands of generations yeah. to the degree to which that those have been maintained. And, right. and I do feel like there's an openness now to one, using science to recognize the, the symbiosis, the relationships, the interactions, the codependencies but also pulling from native indigenous yeah. traditions that have, have basically existed with that recognition, even if they didn't use science, quote unquote, in the same way that, that we use it now. Well, they certainly used observation and probably yeah, absolutely. much more in-depth and meticulous observation, just based on that relationship with nature. Being yeah. out all the time. It was like I, was, I happened to be out long enough and was observant enough to see that bird. <laughs> right. But imagine that's your life. You're out there in nature. You're interacting with it. You get fed by it. You, sh- you help shape it. It's just hard to, it's hard to comprehend what it must have been like for people to live like that day in and day out. Yeah. Well, one last sanity town moment that I want to bring up is that changes for the better can come from really unexpected places. And one of the key examples of that would be the way that the United States got its best suite of environmental laws out of the Nixon administration. I know. That is Amazing. that seems absolutely paradoxical that the most up to that point conservative <laughs> president ever was yeah. like, yeah, Corrupt. we got to get the Clean Water Act, we got to get the Endangered Species Act, we got to get the the yeah. National Environmental Policy Act. Corrupt, mean, paranoid. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and yet somehow what a, what a guy. Somehow yeah. this really critical environmental and really progressive legislation emerged from that era. Right. Yeah, there's a lot that I think that could be said about about the context of that without necessarily putting it all on Nixon's shoulders. But but it's true yeah. that you could get and and I think it's a good lesson for us to recognize that maybe part of the work that we need to do is to think about drawing connections with others who maybe have a different value set or a different understanding of things and to find that commonality because it's kind of hard to imagine now the the consensus that would be needed politically to advance policies like that. Yeah. I feel like there's some hope that we you know we can we can keep making that kind of progress and like you say it, things emerge different thinkers pop up it comes from unexpected places movements evolve it's it, there are possibilities so just want to invite all our listeners to you know it, we're not about false hope at all, but we are about get involved, get engaged, do what you can, be neighborly, make make community better where you can. And uh, kind of want to finish up this season with, on my part, I, I want to say, uh, of course, a big thank you to our listeners. We wouldn't do this if it weren't for you. But, but what I really want to do is thank the two of you, Asher and Jason. I To me, it's a true privilege and honor getting to sit here with you all and come up with some of its bullshit, but but come up with some some insights and some fun and, and some laughs. And it just, I, I really enjoy your company and I enjoy the learning that I get from you. And it's, it really is a, a, a good time. 
It is quite a uh, quite a learning curve that we're on, and the creative process is great. But we all bring something different to it, so uh, it is one of those like synergies that happens that I really appreciate. Because if I try to do it myself, it would be just lousy. <laughs> yeah, I, I appreciate that, Rob, and I think it's it's really humbling to to and and a privilege to be part of something that feels that it really is a group effort, and is very much a culmination of a bunch of different people, not just the three of us, but we've we've talked about Alana Zuber, who did so much research for us for this season, and Melody, who produces the podcast. Yeah, and Anya with the artwork. Yeah, and her Taylor artwork is helping awesome. us with transcripts. Yeah. yeah, and, yeah. And, uh, and along the way, we've had other volunteers as well, and, and people helping us out. So yeah, I really appreciate that. I, I don't mean this to sound like a farewell tour either. Because... <laughs> no, no, because more's, more's happening. Yeah. This is just wrapping up one of thousands of seasons to come. Thousands. Yeah. Oh, Lord. millions. Oh, well, no. once we enter the singularity. Yeah, exactly. We just beam ourselves okay, up. Okay, so we exponential growth yes. in Crazy Town. Uh, we'll have or a Sanity season Town. every 25 minutes. <laughs> the the I, good news is there's not going to be any shortage of fodder for uh, for Crazy Town. Okay, I'm, I'm dialing this back to reality. Uh, <laughs> I do want to let our listeners know that we're going to have bonus interviews coming up after this season, roughly one a month, we think. And we've got plans in work, yeah. in process. You gotta do the evil laugh. Yeah, muhaha for <laughs> season <laughs> five, which. You know, we don't want to give away too much because we don't know very much at this point, but but we're looking at false prophets, yeah. people who are peddling P-R-O-P-H-E-T-S, ideas. O P H E T S P R O F I T S because we got lots of false prophets, yeah. you know, already at this point. Although I, we we may blur the lines between those There's two right. kinds sure. of prophets. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sure. Certainly the false prophets have made plenty of false prophets. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we're looking forward to coming back again and look forward to working with you all and, and keeping things. Yeah. Uh, and if you come across any false prophets, any people out there that are peddling stuff, you know, that you think that we should. Touch yeah, let on, us know. Let us, let us know. know. We want to give a special thanks to Ilana Zuber, our star researcher of the watershed moments through history. Without her work, there's no way we could have covered such sweeping topics this season. Yeah, and we also want to thank our other outstanding volunteers. Anya Steyer provides original artwork for us, and Taylor Antal prepares the transcripts for each episode. And a big, big thank you to our producer, Melanie Travers, who helps us bozo stay professional. And finally, thanks to you, our listeners. If you want to help others find their way to Crazy Town, please drop us a five-star rating and hit that share button when you hear an episode you like. Raytheon Corporation, a leader in advanced weapons systems, has partnered with Corrections Corporation of America, the largest private prison company, to develop a new, secure model for U.S. schools. Raytheon Education. With just a 10% shift in the U.S. military budget, we propose to rebuild all schools in America over the next 10 years to comply with Raytheon Education Standards. Features include biometric vestibules for ingress and egress, PE curricula to drill combat and avoidance skills, and all classrooms and hallways secured by the most advanced AI vision analysis, recognition, precision target acquisition, and guidance systems. Raytheon Education. You better have a hall pass. Crazy town. Da 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 crazy town.